Oh, all right, scholars. I'm glad that you had a chance to see the beginning of flow for the love of water, where it addresses some environmental issues with water. Let's take a look at some details here. This video will help you understand the importance of freshwater resources and water supply and depletion. So let's remember the hydrologic cycle. What we're seeing here is mostly involving freshwater. The only case here involving uh, saltwater is over here with the oceans. But we have water existing as water vapor in the atmosphere. And it gets there by evaporation. Evaporation from lakes, streams, ponds, and the ocean. And it also gets there by transpiration, which is uh, water vapor coming out of the leaves of trees. So the trees take up water from the soil through their roots, and the, the um, plant uses the water, and it also gives off that water um, through its leaves. Okay, and then we have precipitation in the form of rain and snow. Um, and we have, what else we have? We have lots of things. When the precipitation comes down, it lands in the water, and it can do what we call runoff, where it travels along the surface, um, eventually back to the ocean via streams and um, and rivers, etc. Or it can be go into the ground, which we call infiltration. These are words that you will need to know. Infiltration, and then uh, it's becoming what we call groundwater. So it's being stored down here in the aquifer, and the top of the water level within the aquifer is called the water table. And um, and let's see here, we can extract the groundwater using wells. I have a well at my house, and uh, that's where we get all of our water from. It's not quite the little house in the prairie kind of well you might think of. It has an electronic pump, and it's about maybe 30 to 40 feet deep, um, but it's excellent water. It has no chlorine that you find in water that's been treated by the city. Okay, um, let's continue here. So fresh water is water that is relatively pure with very few dissolved salts. And fresh water occurs in lakes, rivers, streams, groundwater, glaciers, rainwater, soil, water vapor in the atmosphere. And a glacier is just basically a river of ice that flows extremely slowly, like maybe a few feet a year. And in contrast, ocean water is salty because salts from land run into it and stay there as surface water evaporates. And the ocean water is about um, well, we'll take a look at that detail in a moment here. Of all the water on Earth, 97.5% is in the ocean, leaving only 2.5% as fresh water. And of that, only 1% is on the surface, right here, this thin amount of blue, dark blue. And this is what we use, um, surface water, well, and groundwater. We can pump water out from the ground. So we're dealing with a very small amount of the overall water that we actually use as humans. And um, let's see here. So 2.5% of the planet's water is fresh water. 1% of that exists on Earth's surface. Uh, only one part in 10,000 of water is easily accessible for drinking and irrigation. So if you just look at these percentages, it comes down to 1 in 10,000. little FYI. So it's a valuable resource. That's the message. So let's take a look here at rivers and streams. Um, bodies of waters that flow downhill <clears throat> hill, joining one another, shaping the landscape. That's an important thing. As this water is flowing, it is picking up sediment, carrying the sediment, and depositing the sediment. And that's why we see along this river bank here, we have a nice sandy beach, a nice place to hang out for an afternoon. And that's because of the um, uh, erosion, or sorry, that's because of the sediment that was deposited as it rounds about here. So maybe the water slows down, and as it slows down, that's usually when sediment gets deposited. And we can see along here. So these are along the banks. And this vegetation we see along the river is called riparian, R-I-P-A-R-I-A-N. That's another word that you'll um, need to be familiar with. And this area that we see next to the river is called the floodplain. And that's an important thing. Uh, it's a good thing, too, that every once in a while it's good for rivers and streams to flood because that sediment they're carrying is usually very nutrient-rich um, and it gets deposited, enriching the soil. So this is a good thing. Floodplains are usually contain very fertile soil, good for agriculture. All right, the watershed, the land area that drains into a particular stream. So we see here um, the side of a mountain and rain hitting it. And the rain, by gravity, flows along the surface. And it flows um, into points of low points. 
which um, become creeks, which become streams, which become rivers, which ultimately all rivers flow back to the ocean. And so the area of land that drains into a particular stream is called the watershed for that stream. Do you know what watershed you live in? Here's a map of the Santa Barbara watersheds. Um, you can click the map to open a version. You can zoom. Well, let's see here. I think we'll do that in class. You can see though, San Marcos, for example, is right is right around here where the where the finger is. So it's along the Atascadero Creek. Um, so San Marcos is within the Atascadero watershed. And I live right by the San Jose Creek. I could practically throw a stone in it from my house. So I'm up here at the top of the mountains. And so um, I'm in that watershed. And, um, you know, if I don't have, say, a properly functioning septic tank, then pollutants from my house are going to be um, flowing into that creek and contaminating it. All right, and that's a little lead into our topic of water treatment in the next video. Here's a nice illustration of groundwater uh, and aquifers. So first of all, aquifers is like a rock sponge, and it holds groundwater in the cavities between the rocks. And so um, we have here, um, yeah, it's groundwater. So we have here um, uh, an unconfined aquifer and a confined aquifer. What's the difference? Well, here's the difference. A confined aquifer is sandwiched between two layers of clay. So here you see upper layer of clay, lower bottom, lower layer of clay. And clay is, um, is not, water is not, clay is not permeable to water. So this water can be under high pressure. And if you could stick a hole through the, all this rock um, and into that uh, confined aquifer, because of the pressure, it would probably shoot up as a spring. And so there are places around the, the uh, planet where we have natural springs, water just popping up from the ground. And usually that water is very nice and pure, oftentimes, unless this groundwater is contaminated. Um, not all springs are from a tapped, confined aquifer, but um, many of them are. And then we have unconfined, which is under less pressure because it's not sandwiched between clay. It has clay underneath, but no clay on top. So it's basically, it's just under less pressure. Um, what else can we say here? Here's a well. And so it's going down to um, this um, upper confining layer, this unconfined aquifer. We have an artesian well, which is going into a confined aquifer. Um, you actually don't need to know the definition of an artesian well, but when we talk about artesian water, uh, if you were to buy artesian water, you would probably pay a premium price for that bottled water because this water in the confined aquifer is most likely more pure. It's sandwiched between clay. It's going to be less prone to pollution from um, from what we call leaching, from you know whether it's a chemical spill that occurred at the surface or from a landfill or something like that. Okay, and then we also have here, you see the water table, the top of the water level, and um, and aquifer recharge area. So recharge is just water that's hitting the surface of the earth, soaking through the earth until it gets to the aquifer, recharging it, um, adding water into it. All right, let's take a look at some details here. Groundwater, definition. Water beneath Earth's surface that did not evaporate, flow into rivers, or get taken up by organisms. It is contained in aquifers, porous sponge-like layers of rock, sand, or gravel. And the water table is the boundary between the upper zone of aeration and the lower zone of saturation. So what do we mean by that? Lower zone of saturation. If we go back to our diagram here, remember we said this is like a sponge. So the part of the sponge that is um, filled up with water is the saturated part. The part above it is filled with air and that's the aerated part. And the water table therefore is at the boundary of those two. Okay, aquifers, definitions here. Confined or artesian aquifer is water under pressure trapped within impermeable layers, often clay. Could be off, it could also be layers of impermeable, impermeable rock. And we have unconfined aquifers. Water under less pressure, no overlaying impermeable layer. And the aquifer recharge zone is the geographic area where water infiltrates soil and recharges the aquifer, and that's a beautiful thing. Something that's not happening enough um, because we are withdrawing water too fast. Here is the Ogallala Aquifer, and it's, it is the world's largest aquifer. It is underneath the U.S. Great Plains, and it makes agriculture productive. This area that we're talking about is the breadbasket of America, where we grow lots of... Um, well, traditionally we grew we grow a lot of wheat there, so bread bread basket.
And you can see it covers many different states. One aquifer. And um, you can see where it is thickest, um, 800 to 1,200 feet. And that's in central Nebraska here. Um, but the thing it is, it is being depleted by use for irrigation. This is grasslands, so there's not a lot of precipitation happening here. But we have excellent soil, so we want to use that soil. So we have to um, get our water and from the ground. We use it as irrigation. Check this image out. A satellite image of agricultural fields in Kansas, watered from the Ogallala Aquifer. This is uh, an image approximately 25 miles by 25 miles. So you, all these green areas are green because of irrigation. All the areas that are not green are because they're not being irrigated. It makes that much difference. So we use irrigation extensively in this region. And it's being depleted. So here's a map showing changes to the water table from 1980 to 1995. Areas in orange represent drops of up to 40 feet in only 15 years. Uh, and that's 40 feet of an aquifer that might not be, you know, more than possibly um, a few hundred, maybe. Well, let's go back to these numbers here. Thicknesses in feet, 0 to 100, 100 to 400, 400 to 800, 800 to 1,200. So 40 feet in 15 years makes you wonder how many more years at that rate will it remain a viable aquifer. So take a look at this, um, these areas here. Um, the areas that are dark red are areas where the water level Water, the water table is dropping the fastest, and as we said, 40 feet in 15 years. Um, so that's alarming because it takes a while for water to recharge. And this water actually is and usually um, water that's in the aquifers, is there for hundreds of years in some cases, in some cases even longer, because um, it goes down there and it can be stored there for a very long period of time. So this recharge process is slow. And um, let's take a look at these available freshwater resources. Our country, you know, has a pretty reasonable. We're in the green, we're in the middle zone, but places of the world like the Middle East, very dry, very little available freshwater per capita, per person. Northern Africa, of course, the same. And look at Europe. Europe is also pretty low, yet um, they have a very high population density. So they are dealing with water issues, trying to make their water sustainable. And because of that, they're a little bit more proactive, progressive about how they manage their water. They have um, a greater number of um, water saving faucets or what we call low flow faucets, low flow toilets, things like that. The idea of the, um, of the uh, um, urinals, the, the um, no flush urinals that we see in almost all new buildings nowadays, those originated in Europe. How do we use water? Well, we use it for consumptive uses, means, meaning water is removed from an aquifer or surface body and not returned. And so, for example, most agricultural, industrial, and residential use falls under this category. Um, so when you take a shower, for example, that's a consumptive use of water. And then there's non-consumptive use. Removal of water is only temporary. So, example, water passing through a hydroelectric dam. We're using the water, but it's just going from the top of the dam to the bottom of the dam. And um, this is a pie chart showing the breakdown. How much water do we use for industry, like factories? In manufacturing, you have to wash things. You have to um, you have to put chemicals into solution. And um, you uh, actually the biggest thing though is for cooling water. That's the number one thing. When you have factories um, or power plants where you're generating electricity, you have machinery, you have heat engines that need to come in and cool. Um, to, in order to keep the process going. So usually these kind of things are built next to a river where you can take in water from the river um, and uh, allow it to pick up heat from your um, power plant and then expel that um, heated water back into the environment. So for our electric power plants, that's where most of this industrial use is coming from. And then of course our agricultural use, um, irrigation. And then domestic use, things for taking showers, washing cars, cooking, etc. You can see India is there. They have a lot higher percentage use for agriculture, and Lithuania a lot higher use for domestic. Why that is, I'm not quite sure. Okay, so um, at the end of these notes, I'd like you to write a summary and then turn to part two, where we'll take a look at water pollution and the water treatment process.